well. Um, so this, um, this week's podcast, we invite Jack Broom. Um, Jack Broom is a very good friend of Orange. He was one of the founders, one of the phone people who um, helped me at the very beginning of Orange. Um, kind of guided me in the right direction. Um, very kind-hearted, lovely young man or old man, however you want to say. Um, so yeah, I'm going to invite him over now and we'll have a good chat. Um, if anyone's got any questions, try and put them in the comments. But when I'm talking, sometimes I get away with it all and I don't get a chance to uh, to read them. But hope everyone's... Hello. Hello. How are we? Yeah, good, man. How are you? I'm good. The hair has definitely grown since I last seen you. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, I've already made a decision that I'm going to cut it after lockdown. <laughs> uh, I got rid of the beard, though, so. <laughs> what, so you've just grown it since the beginning of lockdown? Is that how you describe it? Um, pretty much, yeah. I feel a bit bad on my hairdresser as well, because, like, it's probably made no money <laughs> with everything that's gone on, so. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, how are we anyway? How's life? Uh, yeah, good. Busy. Um, just to be honest, not so much on the music front this week, but yeah, the, the start to the year has been a bit mental. I think okay. everyone's like took last year off to, you know, reevaluate. And mm -hmm. then basically as a result now, everyone's just going for it, hammer and tongs this year. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's been a bit hectic. Um, I had to have the this weekend off just to like, rest because i've just been working pretty much every day since first of january so is that how's it been for you just busy yeah yeah like well james burton for example he's had al already had two eps out a va and we're not even at the end of february <laughs> and he's got a few more lined up so yeah it's been a bit hectic so lovely so um let's let's delve into it so where did the actual career start for you in, in the music industry um okay so yeah it was probably going to be about 2009 jesus um, how long i wasn't even born well i was jesus. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um how old would you have been then 2009 i would have been 11 <laughs> yeah yeah I was, I was at uni i was midway through uni and i was like i kind of like i just got into dance music and i was like fuck it, I want to just try and run a, uh, an event. So basically ran a couple of events and decided I absolutely hated that. Mm. <laughs> it's just not for me at all. Like, And why was that? Um, It was just very stressful. I just don't like, I like to, when I go to the party, just be able to just relax and not mm. worry about anything um, and just be on the dance floor. So for me, it was like, it wasn't that good in that, that sense. I mean, impressively, for the first two events, we made a profit, <laughs> even though it was like 12 quid, but we didn't have any names on our, our lineup. It was just my mates playing up in a, funnily enough, in a room called the Lemon Lounge in Liverpool where I went to uni. Um, and that was, that was where, I'm not sure if you know, like Chibuku started. Chibuku is like, well, known, like, um, in Liverpool. Um, I think Circus might have started there as well, Yousef's brand. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I did a couple of events. That didn't really work out. Uh, a year later, I dropped out of uni, moved across to Manchester. Um, and just through, like, at the time, I was into trance. Um, so just through people in the scene, I like knew this guy called Dan. Me and him had gone down to Ministry of Sound to meet a couple of his like DJ friends and just, j just in general through the scene, I've been like giving people advice, you know, like mm -hmm. practical advice on how to kind of do things to help their career. Just cause it's like, you know, a lot of it is common sense, but sometimes you just need that person to bounce off of, of guidance. Um, yeah, exactly. And so we're down at ministry of sound and these guys are like, why don't you guys manage us? And we're like, me and my friend are like, Went away, didn't say anything to each other. Had like a, a week away, like, and then after about a week came back, I'm like, you thinking what I'm thinking? Should we set up a management company? Um, and it just like, yeah, snowballed from there. Um, and that's where you found your little spot in management. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. And so I started off in trance with, we ran an agent or like management company called Evolved Artists, did that until about 2015. Then I got offered a job down in London for a booking agency, but we were kind of like toing and froing about salary. So I was just like, do you know what? Like, you're obviously not that serious. You mm -hmm. So I passed on it and basically started all over again from scratch in 2015, I think it was, with 17, 12 artists, mm -hmm. just all on my own. So it's like, yeah, starting all over again. Um, and then, yeah, in about... Uh, I think it was 2018 or 19. No, it must have been 2018. I met Callum. Yeah, our lovely Callum. Yeah, yeah. He's just joined. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's how it all started for me. And so, so what intrigued you to be in the, the manager role compared to all the other different... Um, I, th I think it's just my natural... Like, the way I was brought up is to be organised and have, like, a routine in your life mm -hmm. and be structured um so i've always been quite uh, i've be, always been quite analytical and strategic so i guess like i said before with the whole offering artist advice that just kind of came naturally to me so then it would that made sense you know like up until that moment mm -hmm. i've no, not really thought about it the whole reason i'd run the couple of events beforehand is because at that point i was throwing away my uni degree <laughs> and i was like I'm going out so much to all these parties and that I should be able to contribute something back. <laughs> so at that point, when I did the first couple of events and I was like, Oh, I don't like that. I kind of then just took a step back and thought maybe wait and see if something happens naturally. And it did when I moved to Manchester mm -hmm. I kind of like formed naturally. And I think, it, you know, obviously it made sense. I kind of knew what artist management was as well. Like before all of that, because I've always been it, like I've always been interested in the music industry, so um, I just yeah, I'd never put like two and two together in, yeah. in that sense. Because like from a young age, I've always loved music, but like the one thing I'd always love to be able to do is be a singer. But I cannot, <laughs> I cannot sing. I mean, just through sheer dogged determination, I've got to a point now where I can not sound as tone deaf as I used to. <laughs> I still sound shit, but but do you know what I mean? So like, no, no, you I, might find you some vocals on beat pop. Yeah, I always assumed when I was younger that there was no way I would end up in music because I'm not musically yeah. inclined. Um, so yeah, when that then kind of progressed at uni, it was like, ah, oh, this makes total sense now. Mm -hmm. And just just went with the floor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I just gave it a go with the management side of things. And then obviously when I was doing it the, the first time round, we just got to a point in 2015. This is what everyone always says is mad. Like, um, we were just about making enough money for us to both earn a wage. Mm -hmm. And I walked away. Yeah. But it's just like, I like trance music, but only in small doses. Yeah. So it got, it got to the point, and also the, the scene is very kind of, it's not very big, so mm. it's very monopolised by Armada and Anjuna Beats. So mm. if you're not really in with those lot, and both of those have management companies and booking agencies and whatever, so it's like if you're not in with them, it's kind of like there's not much else for you to feed off the scraps. Yeah. So that's why I kind of moved across. And also, like I think it's a natural thing the older you get, like your music tastes evolve. Like now I'm older, like house music is yeah. a bit a bit slower so i can yeah <laughs> i was similar to that like i used to like my trance and techno but i think over the years of raving and, and misbehaving yeah. i, I kind of like going to a rave and talking to people instead of just yeah, yeah. jumping up and down all the time <laughs> yeah, exactly. well yeah uh, since since these lockdowns i've it's only in the last few months I've started listening to dance music again. Mm -hmm. For a good year, I've just been listening to a lot of like R and B, soul, jazz, yes. hip hop, all the above. Yeah, I think I think it's that thing, isn't it? As well, it's like it's hard to put yourself through the pain of 
listening to dance music when you have that connection to it because you can't go out so i'm not like like you see a lot of people posting online go oh i'm missing the rave and i I can't do that because if i do that that allows me to look backwards yeah i agree it's not a good way to be like it's nice to have memories and then to fleeting fleet through your mind but but yeah to be like for me posting about it and stuff like that it's just kind of exacerbating the the longing desire to want to go back to it yeah. out of sight out of mind is the easiest way for me to deal with it i, I completely agree i completely <laughs> agree um so for people like me i'm still relatively new to the scene and me yeah. not being a producer so what benefits does someone having a, a, a manager or your job role have as a producer or someone who's upcoming because obviously at the end of the day they, everyone could probably do their own jobs but people get booking agents or managers so what is it that you specifically do if you so get what my role entails yeah <laughs> what the ins and outs of it all um, i mean the easiest way to sum it up in a sentence but i will also elaborate more about it yeah. is that an artist is like a business especially yes. in today's a brand environment yeah they're a brand well a brand uh, the brand is your identity and your your yeah. how people you want people to be perceived but they're still essentially a business like i don't know if you got someone like a salado for example they're mm-hmm. registered as a limited company on co- company's house um and i i assume i can't remember but you know their manager may have a percentage stake in their business right. because they run various things like events uh, mm-hmm. they'll do clothing mer- you know merchandise um what else record label do you yeah. know what i mean then there's things like publishing as well mm-hmm. um so there's so many different things but i just say you're you're essentially you're just a business manager so right. it's like I don't know, Apple's, you're like the CEO of Apple, but you're the CEO of a, a an artist. Yeah. And, and you right. just oversee yeah. everything, make sure everything yeah. runs smoothly. Yeah, and, and, it, and it will vary from artist to artist. Different artists want you involved to different degrees okay, yeah. uh, in their career. Uh, the other thing is you'll find, you know, obviously with some artists, like not in dance music, but uh, was it, uh, Post Malone, he... Yeah during lockdown launched a wine brand so his manager has helped him facilitate that so ultimately a, a manager is just a go-between to help you facilitate these opportunities yeah and then and then how would you would these approaching these artists come naturally or is it like you'll see an upcoming right i want to get on you or is it a natural of like yeah yeah, it's a tough one originally when i first ever started out i was just like i'm my one thing is not to apart from when i first built my ever first roster was not to approach artists Mm -hmm. just to work really hard with the artist you've got and build a reputation offer people advice network and then it's up to them to come to you to ask Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, it, it depends on who you are as well. Because my thing is, I don't like the idea of poaching people or being too aggressive with it. It's like let let your actions speak for themselves. Yeah, which which so, I can I can see that with because I did have a personal coach, life coach, whatever you want it was, and the only reason I went to him is because not once did he throw it down my throat, not yes. once did he offer he was selling something. I went to him and gave me laws of advice. And over time, I went, maybe it would be beneficial for him to bring in my life and actually have him as a coach. So sometimes, yeah. I, I do think usually that works a lot stronger than not shoving it down. Yeah, yeah I think it's a lot of the laws of attraction thing, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. like too many people try to force too many things when it's clear that it's not meant to happen at that moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the prime example is with producers. You know, I, I would say that 90% of... Beatport is made up of people that, if I'm being, it's very harsh. Maybe people would see it as being harsh, but 90% are not ready or not at the level that they really should be releasing. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be making music. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that, you know, I think people are too eager to get their music out there 
Whereas yeah. like now, like for example, I say to people, if you, you know, you want to be original, like you want to go from transitioning from just being a bedroom producer to having the mentality of being an artist. Yes. Um, you know what the level you of originality you should be aiming for is like man with the red face mm -hmm. kind of level um and if you don't feel that you've made a track that for you could be played in another 10 years time is original it if anything it should be that you finish it and you don't know what label to place it with even though you have all this knowledge about dance music mm -hmm. you shouldn't know because it'll be like a you know a track that's got all these elements in like yeah yeah i completely agree i do completely agree that's something we've struggled with as a brand really and we do we are publishing good music and we get a lot of stuff sent over and i remember at the beginning of the year or at the end of last year i remember i filled my roster for like six weeks apart for the full year and i was like yeah am i just doing this to fill the roster or yeah, am I doing yeah. this because it's good music and it's took me it did take me a, a few weeks and then eventually slowed down i went i think i'm just doing this to fill the roster or to, yeah. to put put stuff out not because i genuinely care about it and that's something you yeah. can see that a lot across the industry but it is a hard trap not to fall into at the end of the day yeah it? yeah i i agree um it's this thing of people have been kind of almost like conditioned in a way to think oh i need to be active like yeah not really, because, I mean, an example I'd use is, like, Hart and Neenan, who I manage. Uh, we took them on, it would have been at the start of 2020. So they were just going through a transition from, like, being tech house to, to minimal. Mm -hmm. um, and they're releasing on fairly decent labels, but it was maybe just below the, like, what I would consider the top level labels. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were releasing lots um, and it was kind of a bit all over the place. Whereas last year, I think they only had like three or four EPs out. So they they did that. So it was like half the amount of releases they would normally have in a year. But quality. Yes. So as a result, they weren't actually spending as much energy in the wrong places, which normally they would, if it was the year before that, where they were releasing like 10 releases, mm -hmm. they're spending this time like doing promo because mm -hmm. they're releasing on smaller average size labels that either aren't well run mm -hmm. or haven't got the clout yeah uh, it's not to say like look i i small labels medium labels have their place but i just say to artists you know question like what that label can actually do for your music yeah before you're even sending it you shouldn't mm -hmm. Know, and and then if or, or if a label like that comes to you first then don't be afraid to ask questions every label should be receptive to it because ultimately the whole role of a, a record label you know years and years ago when they first started was they're supposed to be the experts in marketing your music mm -hmm. so as much as the artist should still be promoting their music now it's still down to the label to be the specialist yeah. who promote it and there's far too many out there that are frankly useless yeah <laughs> yeah you could say it so it, there's there's a way of saying you're busy but not productive at the sort some people can be busy yeah. throughout the year but not they're not focused on the real things yeah but, they're well they're too more concerned about producing content for their socials than they are on if they used all of that time that they've been if that time that they're spending on socials to actually be in the studio mm -hmm they would be miles ahead of where they are in terms of career progression from just being in the studio. Sosa that we used to manage is a prime example of that. He, you know, he, he'd been producing for like six years before his breakthrough, which would have been not last year in the summer of 2019 when mm -hmm. that uh, dirty fucking Coke core track came out. Yeah. Um, and it went viral and it hadn't even been signed at that point. And that was his like breakthrough moment. Mm -hmm. Now, before that, He'd only released on relief at the start of 2019. That was his first ever track was on relief. So that's, you know, a pretty high benchmark. But he'd set that for himself by saying, you know, I'm not going to release until one of my top target labels says yes. Yeah. Um, because he's accepting anything. Yeah, exactly. And then it makes it look like he's burst out of nowhere when he's not. He's been sat at his computer for days on end, well, years on end, 
just perfecting until he got a yes from the core ones. Yeah. That it's just about being a bit more efficient and economic with your time and clever. And also, like, you think about it, like, he's probably, uh, like, from a mentality as aspect, he's got a lot less to worry about. Yeah. Like, the amount of, you know, distraction by, you know, creating a content schedule and all of this yeah. that, you're, that you're taking away from the time you could be in the studio is just, yeah, it's just... It's, yeah. There's so many could... examples of it. Josh Haval as well was another one. Uh, Sawley... Um, Do you see these moments where people say they break through, but yeah, they have broke through, but you'll probably see behind the artist these five to ten years of them actually sitting in the studio. Yeah. You, never find, you rarely find a person who's been producing six months to break through as such. I, I, I don't know of anyone. I mean, no. another exa example on a bigger scale, we might not like EDM, but Martin Garrix, he's been example. going to a perfor performing arts school for ten years before mm -hmm. Animals happened. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And, and he even said, I watched it on this ADE uh, conference back last October when they did in here like a chat with him and like Geta and Timberland. Mm -hmm. And their attitude is, which it, this is how it should be, is just create, create, create. Because for every hundred tunes you make, there'll be something in there that's a hit. Mm -hmm. And that's why then with your batches, you just keep hitting the top labels that you want to be on keep yeah. hitting them again and again and again um will taylor even said it took him like 50 tries to get onto one of his target labels 50 yeah. tries yeah so you think that's like that would have been over the space of like three or four years oh easy yeah easy um so you obviously you managing the these these artists when they yeah. break through as such what are these moments like for you so I'm guessing it's also on such a such <laughs> yeah. A, it's, it's like I, I think the easiest way I can describe it is like it's like winning a World Cup every time. Yeah. <laughs> not not that we know what winning a yeah. World Cup was like. Okay, as much yeah. as I'm old, I was not born in before 1966. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean that's the only way I could liken it to. It's like winning a football match or something like that. Um, Radio One's the one I get the biggest buzz from. Do I don't know what I don't know why. Just like when you hear someone like a Pete Tong or Danny Howard like introduce your artist record, you, you feel so proud. Like mm -hmm. I remember the first time it ever happened. In fact, the first ever time it happened, it was one of my artists, and it was on a record label that I was running with another one of our artists. And like I, I cried. Like, I was just <laughs> so I was just so happy. Like yeah, it's just you. Yeah, I, don't, I can't really put into words what it means. So I can't even imagine what an artist feels like. Yeah. So I do get like the with the whole sending stuff to labels process is the mentality aspect that you can get lost in your own head mm -hmm. um, with trying to, to get signed. And can can you see the, the, the sudden growth from, for example, like you were saying about Sosa when, when that track boomed everywhere could you see yeah. the sudden growth of like bookings and requests yeah oh yeah 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 like it was in instantaneous was like, it yeah 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 um it, so it doesn't always happen like that and that's the thing is the, the good thing for sosa as well is like he could have had if he'd just made that one track and mm -hmm. say say he just made that one track that year and he'd not been producing before that um he you know he wouldn't have had any other music to back it up so then that yeah. momentum would have quickly just disappeared yeah. um and this is why i say you know it's better to you know be quiet for a bit lock yeah. yourself away in the studio because if you keep making batches keep sending them to the labels yeah if you're top and i wouldn't say you know send to every top label on your list because you might have a list of 20 so i would say for each batch make like a you know a top three that yeah. you think send to those top three one after the other not at the same time <laughs> um, and then if nothing after those put them to the sides yeah. doesn't mean that they're not good enough you've just picked three labels out of maybe you could have picked 50 labels mm -hmm. so you think that's a very small percentage exactly it's better to build those tracks up because you know then say when one label suddenly does come to you saying yeah we want want these tracks they might only want one of the tracks that you send them, but you've got another 30 spare. So they might go, yeah, we want another for 
to, to secure the EP yeah, yeah. and you've got all that stuff there. And another thing as well, five years later, when you're more established, you might be out on the road loads. Yeah. So you might not have enough time to be making brand new tracks from start to finish. You've got all these projects left to the side, which you've now learned more about production. So you can mm -hmm. just add to it and evolve, evolve yeah. the track. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, obviously, with being in the music industry for so long now, what are some of the the road bumps that you've seen artists get into, like the typical ones that ev most people get into, like the, the struggles that you see? Yeah, it, I think the, most, the, the biggest one is always self-doubt. There's still this thing of, even though it's an art, I think this is where a lot of people are going kind of a bit wrong in terms of it's the mentality as aspect is the hardest bit and yeah. this is why it's like you know 99 percent probably or that thereabouts don't make it to the very top mm -hmm. um so you know it's only one percent that succeed and that's partly just mentality and yeah the way they set up so yeah i mean for me it's i think because it's a an industry that's based around an art form there's no science to it yeah so you know although I might, yeah exactly but that's where like i think my strength comes in is i come from a very methodical side of things mm -hmm. so a lot of the time like i will encourage our artists to send music to the labels but if i feel like they're having a bit of a period where their confidence is dipping or they have not signed anything for a while and that's because they've been sending stuff but not getting anything back mm -hmm. i will step in and take over because for me, as much as I'm attached to their music because I represent them and I'm a fan mm -hmm. of their music, I'm not right in it like they are. Yeah. So if you take that task off of them, you're at least alleviating some of that weight off their shoulders. It's like I said with the batches thing outside yeah. out of mind. So it is, it's, yeah, it's just it's mainly the mental side of it. And this is why I think, you know, it's a good thing that now more and more people are talking about mental health. Definitely. Um, Definitely. And uh, and that's why we always try and gear everything up towards. As much as I I can happily admit I'm tough with my artists <laughs> a lot of the time. At the same time, it's like I get a lot of my inspiration from old football managers like Arsene awesome. Wenger and Alex Ferguson. You know, in in the public you have their back, but then behind closed doors you need to be tough with them mm -hmm. because it's tough love at the end of the day. Well, it's, it's also it's this thing of, you know, you it, at the end of the day, you are the only one in control of what mm -hmm. happens with you. You can't control certain things like record labels not responding or whatever. Because yeah. I always say to people, you know, there's loads of examples of artists out there that have broke through or made a successful career, like by by not doing it a traditional way, especially in dance music that, you know, people always say with various different aspects of it, like, Oh, well, everyone else is doing X, Y, and Z. I'm like, well, it doesn't really matter what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Do what's true to you. If you do something authentic, it's more likely to connect. Yeah, I completely agree. And <laughs> it, it, it's funny you should say that because sorry, I was just laughing at Callum's comments. I know. I saw it too. <laughs> um, it's funny you should say that is because I was listening to, Ollie Ryder's recent podcast with Josh Baker, and he said yeah. is the biggest piece of advice he had for Animal Crossing was do what yeah, I remember that. do what nobody else is doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sometimes you've got to go down that route. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's like one of my pet hates. I was just saying this on a tweet before. Spinning discs. Like <laughs> I get, I get that it's obvious to know that that is when you post something that that's a release or whatever. Mm -hmm. but it's just like i don't know i've just had enough of them <laughs> yeah that that's that's something we've been trying to get down but it's uh that's something that animal crossing obviously. or just yeah just something like unique and eye-catching like yours is good because orange as well is not a predominantly used color it's bright yeah. and it's yeah i i like i actually your branding's really cool like nice that's, and clean it's, and it's something i've always oh that's obviously you come back to the self-doubt i've always doubted my branding just because me creatively, oh, I'm awful. I, like, I'm absolutely dreadful yeah. creatively. So when I go to these um, graphic designers, I go, oh, can I have this? They're like, oh, what do you want it like? And I'm like, I don't have a clue. 
Yeah. But that's something I struggle with creatively. But when it comes yeah, to like so, I mean, with those kind of things, what I would, my advice would be when you're doing any kind of creative project, like, because I wouldn't consider myself particularly creative either. Um, although as time goes on, you kind of start to realize you are more creative than you think. Mm -hmm. uh, that, just you telling yourself that. But like with a design, what I would do is actually write a design brief. Yeah. And that might sound daunting, but it literally everything I've learned in this industry, I've barely asked a single person. I've just taught it all myself. Yeah. Um, I, I, I say myself, I use resources online, mm -hmm. uh, previous research techniques that I've learned from uni, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and observed what others do and don't do. Um, because my, my, my weakness is that I'm not a very good... I'm not extroverted for sure. Like mm -hmm. I'm like socially awkward. So mm -hmm. I'm not the kind of person that would go out to events, ask people questions, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Not my, not my style. I, I'm more of an observer. Yeah. Um, analytical. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say the other thing is, do you have a branding guide for your, for your label or your brand? See that this is what I, I just, so you can do that through HubSpot. I'll send you some stuff afterwards anyway. Yeah, cause, please. cause, a lot of that stuff I got to say, like I knew all about it, but we've never done it until just recently. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it with every single artist on the roster just because I've not had the time. Like the last few years, especially has been a lot of dealing with bookings and stuff like that, which mm -hmm. shouldn't really be our job. But at this stage of their career, it's like, it's better for us to manage it than either yeah. a subpar agent or a, cowboy agent yeah um it's either the big boys or you don't really bother kind of mm -hmm. thing yeah okay yeah so obviously we talked about the some of the struggles of a general producer but what are some of for, for your struggles as a career or has it been pretty plain sailing for you uh, uh definitely not plain sailing like, I've, I've only been full times yeah since do 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 was it last year? No, it wouldn't have been last year. The year before May 2019. Mm -hmm. Shit, it's nearly going to be two years. It's gone so quickly. <laughs> um, but yeah, before that, I was doing a full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my day would consist of, you know, I'd be at work from 8 till 4 or 8 till 3.30, thereabouts. Um, it was a relatively easy job in the NHS, stress-free, just doing admin. Um, and then I'd get home, have something to eat, and then I'd be working from, like, about five, six until, like, midnight, one, two in the morning yeah. every, every every day, and then going out to events at weekends. Uh, so just, yeah, like, being self-taught. I You know, it probably would have been quicker and a shortcut if I'd tried to pursue the route of going down to London, getting a job at, like, a management company as a junior... Yeah or starting off as an a, a booking agent or something like that, and then going back out on my own. Yeah. But I very much from day one have always had a very specific idea of how I want to run things and how I want to do things. Yeah. And I think it's even harder when you're passionate about something like that to then go and work for somebody else and yeah. basically doing what they want you to do. So I'd be representing artists that, yeah, I might like them, but, I wouldn't necessarily con connect or fully believe in them. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I've taken the long route. And so from a, once again, it's the mental aspect, especially before Callum came along, you know, you're kind of doing all of it on your own. So mm -hmm. no one to bounce off of. So a lot of the time there would be a lot of periods where I have self doubt because you can't see the point at which you get to it being full or anything like yeah. that. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, biggest challenge doing it on my own and finance, you know, if I'd had like more finance, I would have progressed things a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Um, but having said that all of those challenges, I wouldn't change them. You know, I wouldn't, I think like I, I've always said, look, I would never ever play the lottery. And the reason for that is I wouldn't want to just win the money because you're not working for it. Uh, I don't think it's funny. My girlfriend just laughed next to me because how many times I say that and she goes, no, you won't. You keep the money. And I go, I wouldn't. I swear to you, if I won the lottery, I'd give it all away because it's nice. The journey of it's fun. Yeah. I enjoy the, the journey and the struggle of doing it. 
It, yeah, you know, and, and also it's this thing of like you read all the stories of the people that win the lottery, and then that almost I, I can't remember a story I've not read where it's not been a case of them losing their friends and yeah. it ruining their life, and then like another five, ten years down the line, they've got no money left as well. Yeah. The back working as a truck driver or something like that. So yeah, I'd I'd never play it. <laughs> so that that's something obviously when you said about you working for a different if you did work for a different something you have to do you have to do believe in the artist haven't you yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. You, you you don't really have that connection it won't really work so you've got to build a yeah. strong connection with your artists haven't you yeah exactly I, I i won't lie like in the past i've signed the odd artist here and there where i thought oh yeah i'll, I'll sign them because i think they're just going to be big mm -hmm. um and i've tried to like piggyback off of that um but I soon realised as soon as I started working with them, we didn't get on. Mm -hmm. um, and not in a negative way. You know, I always say to artists when they sign, I'm like, look, it's trial and error. You know, this kind of business, it needs to be about the personalities clicking mm -hmm. for it to work. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you just, you're not going to see any progress. And it's nothing personal. You know, everyone's got different personalities. You know, I, I can safely say... I, all of the artists that I, I feel like have left on good terms. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have, obviously still have to ask them, but yeah. <laughs> like uh, we never like a couple of the artists that have gone on to bigger things. I've never like tried to stand in their way or cause a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And then any of the ones we've let go, I still like, I still speak to them and try and help them with their careers mm -hmm. as much as I can. Um, because ultimately at the end of the day I the whole reason I go into this is I want to see artists succeed but also more importantly just as much as that is make sure that they don't get fucked over yeah. and that they're protected yeah because it's, it's a pretty dog eat dog world in the music industry and it's, you can get quite... um, it, so this is my thing is like I don't think it's any more different any any more different any more different than other industries mm -hmm. i think the difference is in music especially underground dance music it's not regulated there's no regulation like for example yeah, 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 yeah. Um, i won't name names but certain brands in certain cities not just in the uk all around the world it's commonplace they have these clauses in place so that big name artists can only play for their brand yeah. in any other industry that's an anti-competitive like kind of clause and yeah. it's illegal it's illegal oh, is but that? this in yeah because it's anti-competitive you think about like big mobile phone broadband yeah, it, providers it, 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 you can only have so many and it's like supermarkets as well they're only allowed to have you know sainsbury's can only have you know it, another sainsbury's within x amount of miles yeah. it's those kind of things because otherwise what happens is monopolies happen Mm -hmm. It happens in trance music, and I can say Anjuna Beats and Armada, because first of all, I don't work in that area of music, and second of all, everyone knows it. That's like mm -hmm. not an uncommon secret. But yeah, I mean, this is the thing, is the problem with dance music is there's no regulation, is the first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people fall into it through partying, uh, so therefore you do get dodgy characters that essentially are just bullies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, those are the two main problems. And that's, that's like, like long-term ambitions for me is to get into those positions of power to affect change in a positive way. So yes, we can er er least, yeah. Yeah, er eradicate the, the, the cowboys that, you know, I, I think I said it earlier in a message is, you know, if someone doesn't want to work with a contract or deal with an, a, a, your agent or manager, they're probably not somebody you want to be working with. Yeah because they don't want any kind of trace left or trail or, mm -hmm. or even leverage that they might get taken to court because they know they're a dodgy fucker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You're definitely right there. <laughs> so speaking of all that about you want to see your artists do well, but what do you, you want to see personally as goals? Is there a, is there a certain booking you want to get for one of your artists? Is there? Uh, oh yeah, obviously I want? think for most of our artists, the dream would be play DC 10, uh, obviously yeah. the church. <laughs> I don't think there's a, any doubt there. I was fucking, I don't even know what I'd do. I don't, I'm not sure I'd <laughs> want to be there, but I wouldn't at the same time because I'm not sure I would be, 
emotional in a state <laughs> like i'd just be crying and yeah yeah i don't know what yeah i'd have to have a, a quite a few drinks first to compose myself <laughs> yeah um but yeah definitely dc 10 just just the dream of like being able to get them to play at all the venues that they want to play at you know some of them have dreams of you know holding like a residency on radio one mm-hmm. um you know that kind of thing essential mixes you know those yeah. these are these are the goals um and also like importantly like we speak to them the whole thing of career goals is what positive things can they do to affect change once they get into these positions you know to help not just the yeah. scene but wider like impact of like i don't know environmental s- sustainability yeah. and things like that which we've already introduced to our rider yeah. um pushed for eco-friendly riders it's just a bit harder at our level to really influence that because yeah. like some are just like well no we're not going to do that and we're not we can't argue and say no yeah okay. not, and but, is it something you sit down with each artist and go like listen x y and z what do you want is yeah this- um, yeah in fact it's what we're doing at the moment the career goals thing so you do yeah. your career goals then you do your annual goals and make sure that they are aligned to your career goals because otherwise why are you doing them yeah you know it's it's once again going back to the main thing is to try and keep artists focused and also they they know their purpose and what their goal is is to go out and become a touring dj but you, if you're giving, if they've set themselves goals um, and a clear path, then it's a lot easier to be motivated because you can mm-hmm. see the journey to that destination. Yeah. It's easy to see the path, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so obviously lockdown's been hard for everyone. What are some yeah. of the artists, because I know there's some, someone straight off the top of the head who shined throughout lockdown. So obviously yeah. Sue, at, Sue at straight away. Yeah, 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 completely changed the scene. <laughs> I've got so many names here. I was like, I was trying to like whittle it down. So I'm going to exclude our artists just because just for not favoritism. <laughs> I, I think they've all shone, shone through. Um, although they'll be fuming if any of them are watching. Um, <laughs> Ozzy Govan, I yeah. think like he's incredible. Like he's he's definitely got a big future in the next few years. Um, who else? On a bigger scale, Gok Wan. He, he like yeah. Gok Wan's amazing. <laughs> Gok Wan's amazing. I think he's been a bit of a surprise for everyone because you kind of assume, just as a celeb, that they're going to be some like either that they can't actually DJ. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's just a kind of a publicity stunt. But actually, he's been really good, and I've seen quite a few promoters saying that they're going to book him after this is all all That's over. Amazing. And I'm actually, I will be well up for that. Because <laughs> it's gonna be like really feel good vibes. Like oh, yeah. everyone's gonna want that kind of style of music. Uh, who else? Timmy P. Mm-hmm. Um, he's doing amazing stuff. Just had one out on Resonance. He's got a few <laughs> others in the pipeline, but I won't say where where they're coming out. ADR. He um, yeah. Yeah. he's very much like a hardware kind of guy. Lots of acid stuff. He's just a genius, uh, quality guy as well. Uh, another one I came across recently is Cabina. Mm-hmm. They did the remix for, or uh, well, they won the remix competition on Luke Van Dyke's label, Dark, Dark Side of the Sun. Yeah, that remix was just so good. Uh, Murphy's Law. They, so for me, they're like, they're the epitome of what artists should be aiming for when they're trying to break through. Because what they've done is they've started to create a sound which has influences from like i guess their childhood and th- their dad mm-hmm. of like you know, like reggae and scar and that kind of thing and they're bringing those influences to their own kind of like minimal rolling tech house sound mm-hmm. uh, another guy who's a genius um and at some point he'll i'm sure he'll be on a bigger stage is josh Gregg from birmingham mm-hmm. he always makes quality music mm-hmm. then um Girls, there's a lot of girls out there as well. Emily Knight, Ed, yeah, uh, Lala from Glasgow, Alicia, her production yeah. has come on so far. Yeah, um, they're amazing. Uh, um, Kinnaman as well. Like I've seen yeah. seeing some of his music being shared. 
um, and he's kind of changed his sound a bit as well. I think this is what's really exciting about this period of like people taking a break is I definitely think like the music quality is going to be so much better because people have had a chance to stop yeah. and that take time with what they're making yeah. and, and also not be influenced by, Oh, what am I going to make for the weekend? Mm -hmm. So okay. there's been a lot more like melody and soul in tracks. Cause I think that was what was largely lacking beforehand. We got to a point where it was a lot of just like, like tech house with percussive loops mm -hmm. and, and a quick like lazy acapella whacked over yeah. the top and it's just like yeah i get it kind of works to a degree but it's like to me that's like the entry level of coming into dance music when you first discovered dance music so it has its place for sure but at the same time it's like you know when it comes to what I'm looking for, what we should be looking for is, you know, originality and music that has soul in it. And like, yeah. you know, it actually speaks to you. And I, I can't say that these, the tech house type tracks are that it's good no. for when you, you know, you first go into raves. Yeah. You first found it. It's like incredible. But yeah. yeah. So what do you think, obviously with these artists, there's a few artists who haven't been present over lockdown and he was like, yeah. oh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it. We'll, it's only it's going to be two months. We're not going to release any tracks. And then, you know, lockdown's four months. Oh, I'll just wait till the end of lockdown. And now it's only been a year and there's not really been any release of tracks. So what do you think is going to happen to these artists? Do I don't think anything is going to happen. Like some people are like, oh, you need to stay relevant. I'm like, that is such a weird way to look at Mm -hmm. like music like you shouldn't be trying to stay relevant like mm -hmm. that's once again it's this whole thing of people are trying to attract attention that's not what being an artist is mm -hmm. it's about creativity and creativity is something that naturally flows from you as much as that sounds like such a hippie kind it of thing but i saw a really good ted talk with joseph gordon levitt you know the actor yeah um, and he was saying, you know, part of the problem is like people are just being distracted because they're trying to attract attention. And like, you shouldn't be trying to attract anyone's attention. You should be focused on the art form. Mm -hmm. Like, go into the studio and don't go in thinking, oh, I'm going to make a tune for Hot Creations because almost certainly that tune will not be right for Hot Creations yeah. because you're already going in with this almost like, I guess, like linear kind of attitude yeah. towards making music that's not creative that you you've already put a limit on yourself you yeah. you know whereas creativity is about freedom of expression and no so you should just if you go in and you make a classical track then that's fine like this is what i say to our artists i'm like don't you know you don't have to go in and just make a house track because you're a house artist mm -hmm. you know make anything you want because the other thing is my job as manager i there's things i can do with that music that that's just sat there to the side that's hip hop, classical, pop music, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that's my job to like either monetize it through publishing, yeah. get it signed under another alias to a record, a major record label or whatever. So yeah, I, I mean, from that point of view, um, I, I, I think people that are worrying about staying relevant, just, um, it's not a healthy way to think. Mm -hmm. It's if anything, it's counterproductive. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the guys that are being quiet, the reason why they're being quiet is because they're building up music. Mm -hmm. You think yeah. about like a good example of that is Scream. Like all is all over lockdown, all you see is him in the studio just making pure tunes. Uh, James Burton as well. Uh, last year, when we weren't like, although I had an idea this was going to be going on for a couple of years, we weren't fully sure. We thought we might be into a better situation at this time. So mm -hmm. last year, by about early summer we'd started to line up like his fir this first half of 2021 for mm -hmm. releases um and you know that's what it's a a about at the moment i think i just say to people use this downtime to just like make lots of music and just have fun with the yeah. whole process and also don't worry if you're struggling for inspiration like you don't you don't have to be sat in your studio nine to five every day because you're not necessarily going to want to create. If you're lacking inspiration, then go out on walks, go and do exercise, yeah. listen to DJ mixes, listen to music you wouldn't normally listen to. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even set up 
uh, collaborations with people just just to like mix it up, mm -hmm. you know, um, or make other styles of music deliberately. Um, but I think, yeah, I think people need to not be so hard on themselves with all of it because also that in itself, putting that pressure on you will actually stifle your creativity even more. Just make it even worse, won't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and what I've, I've found too is, especially when going for for artists for the label, is we do get, we got a lot of feedback and a lot of them are like, yes, we're more than happy to come on, but it's just struggling creatively at the moment just because a yeah, lot yeah. of people do need clubs creatively. They'll go out yeah. and they'll listen to new music eight to say they go and listen to music 10 hours at a weekend at a raves they'll probably get a lot of creative they'll go and travel they'll get creative from that but it's obviously all restricted now aren't we so yeah uh, and that's it and i think some labels um and producers as well kind of over lockdown made different styles of music and you know instead in that period of just been releasing stuff that's radio friendly rather than than club friendly mm -hmm. um so, I mean, yeah, it just depends on your personal preference. But I would, whatever kind of decisions you're making, make it based on what you want to do. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Like, you think oh, about all the top artists that have come and gone, not just in dance music, uh, but in general music. Mm -hmm. They're tra always trailblazers. They're, it's kind of like, fuck everyone else. I'm going to do what I do. And if you want to follow me, follow me. Mm -hmm. And of course, people do because authenticity, especially more than ever now, it's it. You can smell a fake a, a mile off. Oh yeah, a mile uh, off. And that's because that's what happens is people decide they want to be a producer, um, and they they got into music and they like Jamie Jones and they like Hot Creations. So what do they do? They start learning to produce and they just look go on beatport see what hot creations are making and make carbon copies of what they've just released it's like jamie doesn't want us to hear what he's just released he wants to hear the next thing so don't try and second guess him on what he wants just make your own tune and because you're influenced by that anyway without physically trying to reference what they're making mm -hmm. you're probably going to make something within that sphere anyway but if it's got your own twist on it like I even say to people, you know, you don't need to take it so seriously. I remember Suat, before all of this blew up, he was making, like, what is it, those... He was making tunes, but, like, AM, A ASMR tunes. Yeah, the ones you fall asleep to. Yeah, I love that. Like, like, I say to people, you know, make tunes and, like, make it your thing that you only sample nursery rhymes or yeah. some shit like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that that's another thing. People take themselves way too seriously. It's like... Lighten up, have a bit of fun. If you're not having yeah. fun, I don't know how you can do it seriously. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Definitely. Um, so as we as we obviously wrap up this podcast, because yeah. it's gone so fast, we're just flying through it. Uh, what are some advice for upcoming artists, promoters to break through at these difficult times? Because one thing I've found definitely is um the stressfully struggle with the brand is i found i find it really easy to go out and network and build a connection yeah. with someone and be i do you want to come and play at my party that's how i've done uh three of my four bookings for my first party as i went out and i talked to them yeah and I to come and play so it has been struggle for me um speaking because i can't really network with someone online it's not the yeah. same for me so oh you could do like i found recently just having calls with no in like no expectation and no intention is just like just linking up with people because you'll be surprised like most people now just want to have a chat on the phone with people see how everyone's getting on you know it's kind of nice to feel solidarity in numbers that you know because i'm not very good at networking or socializing but i actually feel like the other side of this i will be Mm -hmm. For the first time ever, I feel like I want to because I've connected with a lot more people over this lockdown than I would normally yeah. just by chatting on the phone. And as a result now, I'm just like, yeah, I actually really want to get out and meet people. Whereas before, I would avoid that. I would even do li little things like make little white lies up and say I'm ill when I'm not well, because yeah. of social anxieties mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Um, whereas it's the total opposite now. But for artists, first thing I would say to help with all of this is 
exercise and meditation. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's um, a best ever, both of them. And well, the thing with meditation, like, I like to say, like, the first thing, and I heard it again today on some po- podcast of people that have just started meditation, it's like, I'm no expert, but the one thing I do know is meditation's not about being really good at focusing on keeping your mind quiet if anything it's just the intention to sit away from everything for 10 minutes a day even reading a book is a meditative task um just being off electronic devices i sit on a cushion like a proper hippie Mm -hmm. uh, like this uh, for like 10 minutes a day and yeah some days i have a shit ton of stuff fly through my head Mm -hmm. and you know there might only be a few moments in that period where my mind manages to quieten and then the next day i'll be really like really good Uh, but what it does is it it helps you to kind of learn how to be in control of your mind so that then when in the day when shit does happen where it's your emotions are trying to take control of you you can actually step back from that and be like actually yeah no i'm in control yeah that pissed me off but i'm not going to allow it to affect me boom move on to the next thing and it's the same with something that makes you really happy. You get really elated and then you can't focus. And then it's a bit like, you know, with DJs, they can't focus when they come off and they're on a high after a DJ set. They'll go off, take something, drink something, mm-hmm. just to try and calm themselves down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, that, yeah, that's the main thing for first. But then focus on the music. Just keep it simple. Focus on the music. Make the music for you. Be patient. And do not be afraid to experiment. Yes. You know, the whole point with music is it's a freedom of expression. Um, so there shouldn't be any barriers. So just because tracks are structured in certain ways doesn't mean yours have to be st- structured like that. Try different things. Do different things. It's just like rules are there to be broken. Yep, completely agree. Unless it's a legal lockdown, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> yeah. that, Well, That's a good way of finishing off the podcast. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming on. I do extremely appreciate it. And yeah, I man, it was a pleasure. A big whoever's watching and needs some advice, feel free to drop you a message because e- Emily's another good DJ as well. Definitely. I'm not sure if I mentioned. Yeah. Um, but definitely drop you a message because Heart of Gold always got good intentions and honest. Ah, cheers, man. But yeah, thank cheers, you, man. I appreciate, I appreciate it. everything at Orange as always. So. All right, no worries. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. Definitely. It's been a pleasure. Well, anyway, have a good rest of your night and look after yourself. Yeah, man, I'll send those uh, bits over about the branding guide and that for you. Thank you very much. All right, speak to you later. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye, bro.